Okay, uh, hello everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, um, Induced Mutations and Tilling in the Era of Genome Editing. Uh, my name is Chris Ridley. I'm Project Sales Manager at Eurofin Genomics. Um, we're very happy to hear, uh, have today Dr. Brad Till um, from the University of California, who's going to be our main presenter um, for the webinar today. Just to give a quick uh, thank you to the people organizing this, to Kamini from Global Engage, and to Desi from Eurofins Genomics uh, for helping us put this webinar together. Um, just a, a quick overview then of the, the, the format. So the first speaker will be Dr. Till, um, and then I will give a, a short overview of agrogenomic solutions that we have um, at Eurofins. And then towards the end, we'll have a, a 15 minutes Q&A session. Um, and we of course invite everyone to submit their questions through the chat box, please. Um, so perhaps I could, give a quick description of, of Dr. Till's presentation. So Dr. Till will provide a background and history around the use of induced mutations for forward genetics, um, giving some examples of triploid banana and resistance to fusarium wilt, TR4. Um, additionally, Dr. Till will describe the use of tilling in tomato and discuss his recent review in trends in plant science regarding the complementarity of induced mutations alongside precision gene editing methods such as CRISPR. Um, just to give a bit of background on Dr. Till, he is a molecular biologist and genome scientist with over 17 years of experience using genomics to facilitate functional genomics, genetic screening and breeding. Uh, this includes developing and running high throughput mutation discovery assays and services. He helped develop the Tilling reverse genetic method and ran the Seattle Tilling Project facility for many years. Subsequently, he joined the United Nations FAO, i.e. IAEA joint program to target reverse genetic technologies to understudy crops important to food security in developing nations. Dr. Till received his PhD from the University of Oregon and currently works with the Veterinary Genetics Lab at the University of California, Davis, with a focus on bioinformatic analysis of whole genome and targeted amplicon data sets in animals. Okay, so with that, I'll hand over to you, Brad. Great. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Chris. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, thanks to everybody at Eurofins for giving me the opportunity. I'm going to go ahead and um, uh, try to share my screen. And if that works right, uh, great. If not, uh, Chris or Rick or somebody can, can, can give me a shout. Okay. Hopefully everybody can see this. That looks good. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, yeah, thanks again. Uh, and good morning and good afternoon and good evening to everybody, wherever you are. It's a little bit early here in California, uh, but hopefully I can, I can give a clear presentation. Uh, so uh, uh, as said, uh, I'll be talking about induced mutations mostly today. And, uh, you know, the concept of mutations been around since, since life began, and it's the fuel of evolution and why we're all we're all able to be here today and working on computers. But the, that process is relatively slow. And, and, and by the beginning of the 20th century, geneticists really hit a kind of roadblock with the slow rate of spontaneous mutations uh, to get new phenotypes uh, for their studies. And uh, what uh, Muller discovered in, in the 1920s was that you could treat Drosophila melanogaster with ionizing radiation and, and X-ray specifically and, and get uh, phenotypes orders of magnitude faster than happen in nature. Um, and that was, you know, a, a few decades before they understood that DNA was a genetic material. So you can create novel variation by mutating cells. And this, uh, shortly after Muller did his work, uh, Stadler started working with plants. And by the 1930s, you have the first uh, released uh, mutant variety, a plant variety that was created by using induced mutations. And that was sort of the birth of, of what's been called mutation breeding. Uh, the IAEA, the, the FAO-IAEA joint program, the IAEA in, in Austria, curates uh, a database of officially released mutant varieties, and you can look at that here. Uh, hopefully you can see my mouse. Um, there are more currently more than 3,300 officially released mutant crop varieties, and we did a pie chart here a few years ago. The, the most common uh, uh, crop is rice followed by barley and then chrysanthemums or flowers. So you have food and, and flowers in the top three. And, and, and most of this is actually uh, 
uh, brewing and uh, whiskey industry, I think. Um, and if you look at uh, examples of, of mutant varieties, commercially important, uh, there are examples such as Rio Red Grapefruit, uh, disease-resistant re peppermint, which grows in the Pacific Northwest here in the United States, uh, Golden Promise Malting Barley, I talked about barley, and also uh, Diamant, which is widely used and been intergressed in, in, uh, for the beer brewing industry in Europe. Now that's, uh, uh, you know, in, in sort of the West, and the FAO and IAEA have been working a long time to promote induced mutations and mutation breeding uh, for the developing uh, countries and one example is high iron rice in Vietnam, uh, which ha really has uh, high market value. It's aromatic rice and, and has actually had uh, major impacts on improving uh, farmers' livelihoods and the local livelihoods in, in Southern Vietnam. Now, if we dig a little bit further into this database, uh, you can ask a question like, how are these mutations made? About half of these varieties were produced with gamma radiation, 17% uh, X-ray, 11% chemical, and then there are other mutagens that make up the rest or combinations of mutagens. Now, one of the interesting things, and I think maybe the power of, of traditional mutation breeding is it's a forward genetic approach. And by that, I mean, you know, you mutagenize your plants, it's typically seed, you look, you look in the greenhouse or in the field, and you just look for the phenotypes that you you're interested in. And, and it is, it's interesting that, so this is powerful because you don't need to know about genetics or have any skills, you know, in, in molecular biology. And, and oftentimes uh, there's, you can direct, people have directly released the uh, plants as a, as a variety, or you could do back crossing and whatever. Now, if you care, you could go down uh, after you have the phenotype and try to understand what the underlying genotype is. But in that database, there's very few examples where efforts have been made to understand the, the, the gene function that's causing the phenotype. So I think there's a lot, actually still a lot to learn about those varieties. Now, this is in contrast with, with, with the, which is what is called reverse genetics. And in reverse genetics, uh, you start with your hypothesis about what a gene uh, function might be, then you create a mutation in that, and then you, you test that hypothesis by looking at the plant and assaying the phenotype. And I'll, I'll give you an example later about uh, tilling reverse genetics, but this is basically genome editing is a reverse genetic technique as well, like CRISPR, because you know the gene, you design your mutation, then you do your phenotypic test. And it's, it's the reverse of traditional forward genetics. Okay, as I said, uh, I'll start, uh, before I talk about reverse genetics, I want to give you an example about uh, kind of a modern application of forward genetics, excuse me, and that is in bananas, and the reason I choose bananas is, well, they're very cool, I just had one for breakfast this morning, um, and, and most of us eat these uh, sweet Cavendish style bananas, uh, and they're genetically interesting and challenging for traditional breeding. And that's because they're triploid, uh, sterile, and parthenocarpic, and they're seedless. If you've eaten a banana, you, you don't see any seeds in there. Um, and one of the, probably the best example of a mutant variety in banana comes from Malaysia. And this is a, a variety called Navaria, which was created with gamma radiation. And it's, it's one of its main traits is that it's early flowering. Uh, so early maturing bananas, you know, you can, this is a way to avoid uh, uh, both uh, disease and also damages from tropical storms, for example. Uh, so that's been really quite a, uh, quite a um, important crop. Uh, however, like it was released and, and it wasn't really characterized further. So a few years ago, we wanted to look deeper into the genome here to find out what might be going on. Uh, and what we did is we used low coverage whole genome sequencing uh, to look for copy number variations that might be induced because of double strand breaks and, and, and the re resolution of those um, during the mutagenesis process. So uh, what I'm showing here is one of the chromosomes. This is chromosome five. It's about uh, 29 million base pairs. And what we've done is we've taken the alignment uh, files and looked at the coverage and basically binned uh, the average coverage every 100,000 base pairs. And so as you walk along the, the chromosome here, we have both uh, the Grand Nain, which is the parent that was mutagenized, and Novaria. And you see there, the plots are overlapping until you reach this, this region here. Uh, we set the mean 
uh, coverage to three because it's a triploid. And what you can observe here is a single copy deletion, and it's a very large one. It's a 3.8 million uh, base pair deletion that's uncovered in this region. And so we can see very large genomic changes that have happened in this, in this banana. Now, we had previously, and it's now about a decade ago, or exactly a decade ago, that we'd shown that you can take banana meristems and tissue culture and mutagenize them with the chemical mutagen EMS that produces point mutations. And we found that we could get a high uh, frequency of point mutations, and those point mutations were stable and inherited mitotically. Uh, and as we were doing that work, we also learned that the genes in the banana genome can, can become functionally diploid or haploid, and that's because there's no meiosis. Uh, and so there, there's no mechanism for recombination and independent assortment to expunge spontaneous mutations that have accumulated over time. And so that might explain why you could see phenotypes in a triploid uh, when you might only be mutating one copy or one copy of hundreds of genes in this case. So with those things together, we decided that uh, forward genetics and banana would be a good uh, thing to use to try to tackle a very important problem that's happening globally or a threat that's happening to bananas. And that's uh, Fusarium will tropical race four. So if we think about bananas globally, 45% uh, of the bananas are Cavendish type. And these are all, because they're, you know, they're seedless, they're all clonally propagated uh, via tissue culture. And that has created a big genetic bottleneck when you look at, when you think about the diversity of, of uh, bananas grown around the world. And, and this Cavendish type that's grown is susceptible to Fusarium will tropical race four. Uh, and that can really devastate uh, production. So we wanted to take a, a forward genetic approach for this. This is a project uh, that um, I helped set up when I was working at the IAEA in Austria. Uh, in vitro plantlets, uh, you know, you get the plantlets, you isolate meristems, and when you do the mutagenesis, right, and then you take some steps to remove chimeric sector sectors that happen because you've mutagenized multicellular uh, tissues here. And then what we do is we do some uh, genomics here to make sure the mutations are accumulating and we've got the dosages right. And then we go on with phenotyping. And as I said, uh, I, this project was started and is run by uh, the UN and the FAO IAEA joint program. Uh, we, for this part of it, we are collaborating with Altus Viljoen's group at Stellenbosch University. And Duroy in South Africa provided and do generously donated uh, banana plantlet material that we could uh, mutate in Austria and then do the genomics on. And then this material was sent out to a TBIR, a TBRI, excuse me, in Taiwan uh, for phenotyping. And you can see these are banana plantlets and we're looking at the pseudostem here. And you can see uh, inoculated plants that show a high level of, of um, uh, resistance and a high level of susceptibility or, or disease, if you want to say disease phenotype. So these look pretty normal, like they, they haven't been stressed, and these look very diseased, and the ratings go from uh, zero to four down here. So in this pilot study, we can see both with EMS and with uh, two different uh, gamma radiation treatments, we have um, a percentage that show some resistance. And that's pretty exciting. And Altus's group has been uh, running with that and following up on that and doing more work uh, to, try to, to try to address this um, kind of global threat to banana production. Okay, so that's a, one quick example of, of forward genetics. And then when we think about reverse genetics with random mutations, it, uh, many applications, it's called tilling for targeting induced local lesions in genomes. This is a method that was developed by uh, Claire McCallum uh, when she was a graduate student with Steve Hanikoff up in Seattle, uh, working with Luca Komai as well. Uh, I, I always say that because I didn't have anything to do with naming it, even though the sounds like my last name. Uh, now, if you're familiar with this, or if you're not familiar with this, I'll just walk through this really quickly. So you, if you mutagenize seeds, for example, the M1 plants are chimeric. And what you typically do if you have a self-fertile plant is to go through a single seed descent. And, and what that allows you to do is, is fix mutations in lines and have every line, the, if the mutagenesis is random, every line will have different mutations for the most part. And in diploids, you can, you can uh, for e when you're using a chemical like EMS, you can you can induce and maintain thousands of, of novel point mutations in the in a genome. Uh, so you could have if you have enough plants 
and you have a high enough mutation density and you balance that right, you can guarantee uh, a high probability of having one deleterious mutation, at least in every gene in the genome. So at this point, what you do is you collect the seed and you make a seed library, and then you can make a DNA library from these plants. And then at your leisure, you can have a question about a gene function and you can do reverse genetics by screening the DNA population uh, for novel mutations. And then when you find one, you can go back to that seed and, and plant it out and uh, do your phenotypic evaluation. Uh, now over time, and this, was started in the uh, late 1990s. So it's been around for a while. And over time, there's been a lot of different work on mutation discovery and different methods for recovering mutations. Um, uh, the Probably the current, one of the current most common ways of doing this is by pooled amplicon sequencing. So you PCR up the genes that you're interested in to do the screen, and then you apply next generation sequencing on top of that, uh, usually Illumina short read sequencing. And this, uh, when you do it this way, it's been coined uh, tilling by sequencing by, uh, by Luca Kamai's group. So the example I'll give for reverse genetics is one in tomato. And this is a collaboration I had with uh, Rami Sharma's group at the University of Hyderabad in India. Uh, with uh, Pratik Gupta being the graduate student that, uh, that did a lot of the work. Um, and so what, and the reason I, I bring up tomato, it's one that, I, it's a project I've collaborated on, but uh, as an example, one of the things about EMS in, in chemical mutagenesis is that in some species and in some genotypes, you reach uh, what we've been calling like a kind of a cytotoxic barrier where you can't increase the dosage higher because you start to kill the plants. And it's and some species, they the plants die before you can accumulate enough mutations to make it worth your while to do the screening. And this has been an issue. Uh, and, and what Ramesh's group uh, came up with, the idea was to do iterative mutagenesis. So what you would do, mutagenize, accumulate enough mutations, but then stop before you, you go any higher and kill plants, let the plants recover, collect the seed and mutagenize again. And I think that's a kind of a, a clever and, and very powerful way to get over um, issues that sometimes arise with chemical mutagenesis. Now, another feature of, of tilling by sequencing is that because you're doing, you know, next generation sequencing's gotten cheap and you're going to be sequencing amplicons, you don't actually have too many novel nucleotides that you're, you're assaying in a sequencing reaction. And that means you can get a very high depth of coverage and that allows you to pool genomic DNAs together and, and you know, simultaneously screen many, many uh, hundreds to thousands of samples in a single experiment. And the way we do this is three-dimensional pooling. Uh, whereby you have different lines pooled together uh, before you do the screening. And the three dimensions allows you to uh, organize your pooling in a sort of cube-like fashion where every time you have a mutation in a plant, you're screening that plant three times. And this is a frequency graph of mutations, uh, two different mutations here from the, from the paper. Uh, and you see that a real mutation has uh, three hits and the three hits are in three different locations in your pool. And knowing those coordinates allows you to unambiguously know which plant has this um, mutation without having to go back and assay every individual plant in the pool or DNA from the plant in the pool. Okay, so you can do different uh, poolings. And um, in this study, 55 amplicons were assayed covering 25 genes. And Pratik actually came to work with me uh, at the IAEA when I was there. And we did all the uh, tests on doing PCR and normalizing the PCR and making the libraries. We actually did the sequencing ourselves uh, on a MySeq. Uh, and he was looking at six different variant caller softwares to, to find these mutations. And in the end, uh, they were able to recover and validate 64 uh, novel mutations in, in these genes. Now, one of the features I wanna point out here is that the, you know, doing the assays, there's a little bit of technical optimizations that you need to consider because uh, you have, you're pooling things a lot. So the frequency of the variant allele that you're looking for gets very, very low uh, in the pool. And uh, you then have to, 
you know, make sure that you can separate signal from noise in the assay. So all these other dots are the noise down there. And I think I can, I can better show this in the next slide, which is not tomato, this is rye. Um, and this is a, a collaboration I have with uh, Hannah bullebok bragajeska's group at the University of Warsaw in Poland. So we're looking at natural variations here, but it's, it's 96 fold cooling. So it shows you what's going on here. If you look at the uh, frequency of the variant allele, so things over here would be homozygous. This is heterozygous, right? And as you pool things together, uh, you get all of these sort of subheterozygous frequencies. And at some point in time, you go lower and lower and lower. And you can see in this graph, so these are real mutations and you'll have to, or real natural mutations in this case, you'll have to take my word for it. And down here, these are uh, kind of stochastic errors that may be coming from PCR or the sequencing itself. And so you can see the data changes quite a bit. And so the, one of the things to note about these is that they're, they're single events, you know, they're errors. And so if you do a three-dimensional fold pooling and tilling, like I just showed, you would never, these would never come up as even candidate false positives because they don't appear more than once and you wouldn't, you would, you would dismiss them as noise in the assay. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, now, one more thing I want to try to cover before I, I get to the last kind of summary slides is, is uh, we've been working for a number of years to make uh, assays uh, amenable to uh, laboratories in many different countries with many different levels of infrastructure. And we've been working on various low cost methods. And the recent iteration of this is work that, uh, that I did with uh, Claudia Sorio, who's at INEA in Temuco in Chile, along with my wife, Rachel, and we were living down in Chile for a while. And what you see here is uh, photos from Chile where we've collected Berberus darwini and we've collected flax over here. And we've come up with, you know, adapted methods for collecting tissue in the field where you don't need liquid nitrogen, you don't need a minus 80 freezer, you can store everything in silica. Uh, and then we've, we've modified and adapted do-it-yourself DNA extraction down here that you can do at one-tenth the cost of a kit. Uh, we didn't have a functional gel doc system, and so we built one. It's a recycled computer, an old camera, a cardboard box, and some blue LED lights and some open source software. Uh, so you can do all of that. You can read about that in this biotechnics paper. Um, and then we've also been working on a computational thing. So you could do a lot of analysis these days with you know, a small computer. And if you need you know, real processing to do alignments and whatever, uh, it, it's not that expensive anymore. This computer here is what I'm using to talk to you on. Uh, and I, I configured it to have 256 uh, gigabits of RAM uh, distributed over 16 threads. And that's enough power to do a lot of analysis. And it cost me less than, uh, than uh, $1,700 uh, using uh, refurbished parts. Okay, another thing, and I put on the title so I wouldn't forget, optimizing amplicon sequencing. If you're interested in the amplicon sequencing stuff, uh, you can also read this G3 paper where we look at fragmentation of larger PCR products and also discuss and evaluate different ways to quantify the, the PCR and normalize the concentration of PCR to get better even coverage. Okay, so then to kind of wrap it up, so that's some background on induced mutations that have been, you know, uh, used for 80 years. Uh, what can we say about genetic variation in 2022? Well, we have more opportunity now than we ever have had in the past as, as scientists and researchers and plant breeders. Um, and this comes from a, a paper we I recently wrote with Christian Jung in, in Trends in Plant Sciences. Uh, I'll go through this a little quickly, but uh, you have, you know, you have a lot of opportunity to look at natural uh, diversity and natural variation. And there's these great uh, gene banks out there now, and there's a lot of diversity that's being collected. And so you have opportunity to exploit uh, the natural diversity uh, to reach your breeding objectives. Uh, you can also induce changes. We talked about random mutagenesis, and you can also use targeted mutagenesis or genome editing. And then there's other things like cell fusion and transformation. So, you know, you kind of want to increase the genetic diversity to the point where you're getting phenotypes and then take steps to reduce the genetic diversity so you have, you know, the, a clean phenotype. Um, for your work. Uh, now, I want to just focus on random mutagenesis versus targeted mutagenesis for my last main slide here. And, and this, so I was talking with Christian and we were trying to, you know, 
how do we give advice to people if they want to consider what they should be doing? Should I do forward genetics or reverse genetics or um, should I do genome editing or CRISPR? So we try to come up with this it's a little bit complicated, but then these decisions are not always uh, super easy when you're trying to decide what to invest your time and resources in in your research program. Uh, obviously, you start with the desired phenotype. So you have a plant uh, crop and you want a phenotype might be disease resistance whatever and then you can ask yourself if you know or don't know the candidate genes that might be driving that now if you don't have any knowledge uh, the decision is pretty clear you can do forward uh, genetics you can just mutate the plants and look for phenotypes that's what we did in banana it's still a good idea in a lot of cases and you can consider the fact that the in vivo role even though we have whole genome sequencing the in vivo role for most plant genes has not been established you know so there might be a lot of interesting genes that people haven't found yet, and you could discover new things by doing forward genetics. There's also no regulation or IP on induced mutation, so you can do whatever you want and, and uh, you don't have to think about that aspect of things. Now, if you know the candidate genes, then you can take a reverse genetic approach. And you can ask yourself a few questions here. Uh, I mentioned regulatory IP issues, uh, and, and probably a, a really big one is a biological issue. You know, if you want to do genome editing, you have a construct and you need to be able to transform the plant or get an RNP into the plant. And that can be challenging and restricted in some species to certain uh, genotypes. Uh, and you can really do mutations in just about anything. So uh, if you have a biological issue, that might drive you to want to do a reverse genetics uh, kind of tilling approach. Um, if not, you could go ahead with, uh, with uh, genome editing, and you can also consider kind of hybrid approaches. You could imagine a case where you want to do genome editing, you don't have it established yet. You might use tilling to validate your genes. Okay, this gene actually does give me this phenotype, then it's worth my while, to vice versa. If you have a, a setup, if it's, you know, your, your facility is working well, uh, then you can go ahead and, you know, maybe use uh, genome editing to validate all of your genes. Uh, and then if you have any other issues, you could make a natural, you know, induced mutation version of that uh, for your downstream work. Okay, so that's what I wanted to talk about today. I'm, just about on time. Um, I, I mentioned that induced mutations can produce novel uh, variation and that hasn't happened in nature before and that's orders of magnitude faster than spontaneous mutations. This has been used since the 1930s and it, it seems to work in any species. You can induce mutations in just about anything. Um, and you know, since the 90s, we've been able to use mutations in a reverse genetic fashion doing screens like tilling. Uh, I didn't talk about genomic background selection, but there are nice new tools to reduce the background mutations uh, to get your mutation in, uh, quickly into an elite uh, genetic background. And um, when you're thinking about what to do, if you're interested in making a new mutation, uh, genome editing versus tilling versus forward genetics, you know, you can kind of map out your objectives and your constraints and that, that should Hopefully that uh, figure can help guide people make their decisions. Okay, just to end then, there's a lot of uh, collaborations I've had over the years and I, I talked about some of these today and I don't have time to read everybody's name off, but I do wanna give a big shout out to the FAO IAEA team. There's a lot of people there and a lot of the work I talked about um, was started and uh, supported by uh, the group there. And I think with that, I can stop talking and just say thank you for your attention. Thanks, Brad. That's great. Absolutely on time to the to the second. So I really appreciate that. Um, I can see there's a number of questions coming through in the chat box already. So that, that's fantastic. Please keep those questions coming in. Um, we will open the questions after I've given a, a short overview of, of the services that we provide at, at Eurofins um, for the next sort of 10, 15 minutes. So I'm just going to share my screen and hopefully you can see everything. Okay. All right. Hopefully that looks good. Uh, okay. So, um, hi everyone. My name is Chris Ridley. I'm, I'm project sales manager at Eurofins Genomics. And today I just wanted to give you an overview um, of 
the range of services we can offer to, in, uh, to researchers involved in agrogenomics. Um, perhaps some of you are not familiar with Eurofins. Um, we're a large company, a very large network of service providers globally. Um, we're present in, I think, over 50 countries now. Um, this slide's a little bit out of date, um, but we have over 800 laboratories and we service uh, a very wide range of industries. Um, and this is just really a, a very quick overview of that, uh, that sort of constellation um, of industries that we, we service. Within that, genomics is, is a core functionality. Um, so we provide genomic services, uh, not, only, not only to agriculture, but also to, uh, to research um, and also largely to the pharmaceutical industry. Um, within agrigenomics, we have essentially two primary locations. Um, in the US, we have uh, sites at Wisconsin and Colorado. Um, these, are, these are the Eurofins biodiagnostics labs. Um, whereas in Europe, we have Eurofin genomics um, and we have two primary locations. Um, in Germany, we have our sequencing facilities for Sanger, um, as well as a lot of qPCR applications. And then in Denmark, we have a very large site for microarray, um, microarray testing. Um, and we, we generally service the, the European region, but um, also um, cover a lot of sites outside of Europe, in, in Asia and also Australasia. So one of the things I wanted to cover today was just an overview why you might consider using a service lab for your research, um, particularly when it comes to agriculture genetics. So within agrigenomics, um, I guess one of the main drivers is the, the price sensitivity of genetic testing. Um, unlike in pharmaceutical industry where um, genomics testing typically is, is quite expensive, in agriculture there's a, a very low expectation for cost per data point. Uh, and this is where a large company like Eurofins can really help. Because we're a large network of labs, we've been able to leverage the economies of scale, and this allows us to, to drive down our, our costs. Um, and we think this is a, a really, um, a really uh, suitable way for, for achieving the, the cost per data point needs that, that agriculture genetics uh, research are looking for. Furthermore, um, a lot of the time, researchers are working to, to tight deadlines in order to meet uh, breeding cycles for downstream progeny selection. So having a, a service provider that can meet fast turnaround times is, is essential. And the way we achieve that has been through automating a lot of the production pipelines we have, um, everything from nucleic acid extraction, uh, things like library preparation, sequencing, and, and genotyping is all done as, as efficiently as possible. And by optimizing each step of the process, we're able to achieve very fast turnaround times. Furthermore, within agrigenomics, there's a wide range of applications, everything from a single marker up to entire omics level research. So having the ability to scale our solutions to meet uh, a variety of different needs um, is, is essential. And for that, we have a number of different platforms. And I have a couple of slides later, which just summarize the, the, the broad range of technologies that we can offer to researchers. And two of the main ways we, we support these kinds of projects is through our, our consultative um, um, services around scientific uh, and technical support. So often researchers come to us and they're not entirely sure what's the best solution um, to address the research goal. Um, this is where our experienced scientists can help advise on the best technology platforms and the best approach to choose. And furthermore, that's supported by a team of project managers whose job it is to make sure that the progress of the project is clearly communicated throughout. Um, and that also, most importantly, we meet the, the deadlines uh, and deliver on time. So at Eurofins, we've built out um, a toolkit of technologies and applications that can be applied to um, a range of, of agriculture research topics. Um, everything from market discovery, um, market trade linkage associations, selective breeding, and as I mentioned earlier, whole omic level research such as genomic selection. And as service providers, we've tried to align our technology platforms to be able to meet the needs of clients, um, both in terms of the, the complexity um, of the project, and also at the same time ensuring that we have platforms that are cost effective and can, can meet the tight turnaround times needed. 
without sacrificing on data quality. But the main take home message is there's no single platform that can do all of these applications. Um, so you obviously need multiple platforms um, to be able to accommodate this. So here I've just um, presented the, the main technologies that we have within Eurofins according to the number of markers that you can uh, analyze from each sample. Um, so by doing this, we can see really which platform is best suited to different phases of research, whether a researcher is at the discovery phase, um, whether they're involved in selective breeding, or whether they're even involved in, in downstream screening applications, which I think is more geared towards industrial clients um, looking to develop things like hybrid seeds. And when we align these different technology platforms um, according to the, the estimated cost per sample, we can see there's a definite trend between the number of markers, the amount of data you get, and a corresponding increase in price. And by, by visualizing it this way, we can help customers manage their budget much more carefully by ensuring that we, we balance that need for the data they need to answer their biological question, at the same time fitting everything within budget. And for the next uh, sort of half of this presentation, I just wanted to cover two types of genotyping by sequencing applications that we have at Eurofins. Um, these are called midplex targeted GBS um, and something called GRAS-D GBS, which is, is probably fairly new to, to most of you. Um, but if you've ever heard of um, uh, RADSeq or reduced representation library sequencing, this is a very similar uh, type of application. So I just wanted to briefly summarize what these are. Um, Hopefully these will be potentially interesting for some of the projects you're involved in. So as I mentioned, midplex is a targeted form of genotyping by sequencing. Um, this is a, a really great application for um, looking at known sets of genes. So applications such as marker-assisted selection, where you have a panel of, of SNP markers that you want to genotype from uh, a population from a breeding cycle or a breeding uh, project. Um, the idea being that we can target anywhere from around 25 to 1,000 SNPs per sample. Um, and this is really suited to projects where you have at least a few hundred samples um, per sequencing run, uh, just in order to maximize the, the cost efficiency of the NGS platform. So to design a panel, obviously you need a reference genome. Um, and the idea is that we design multiplex amplicons um, that, that basically flank the, sequen, uh, the SNPs of interest. Um, those are multiplexed and we run those on the Illumina NovaSeq platform at our site in Germany. Uh, furthermore, the entire process is fully automated, um, including the upfront extraction if that's also something that's required. Um, we do have the ability to extract DNA from, from leaf samples. Um, and according to whatever your, your project dimensions are, we can do Small, small sample volumes on an R&D basis or scaling up to high throughput applications for, for routine um, breeding projects that you may run year to year. Uh, the performance of Midplex uh, is highly robust. Um, we get a very good um, conversion rate of at least 95%. So that's converting a SNP assay into a functional amplicon um, and very high call rates in the high 90%. The process by which we achieve this is basically an iterative panel optimization process. So we optimize um, essentially how we uh, balance the primer concentrations in the amplicon mixes. Um, and this image on the bottom right here just shows you how um, we can improve the, the uniformity of coverage um, across the amplicon pool um, by successfully optimizing um, those primer concentrations. Um, so typically, by the time we get to a, a version two or a version three of the panel, uh, we're in that high 90% uh, sample call rates. And one of the great things about Midplex is that it's very low cost. So a typical project, we can achieve um, cost per sample in the range of five to 10 euros per sample for anything from around 200 to 400 SNPs per sample. As I mentioned, the main applications here for research involved in plant genetics is probably marker assisted selection. If you're working in, in livestock genetics, this is a, a really great tool for applications such as parentage, verifi parentage verification, where you're typically dealing with around 100 to 200 SNPs per sample. So that's midplex. Um, the other GBS application we have is called GRAS-D. Um, now, this is more for genome-wide genotyping. 
Grads D, as I mentioned earlier, is sort of similar to RADC in that it's a reduced representation library sequencing approach. Uh, Grads D stands for genotyping by random amplicon sequencing direct. That's a bit of a mouthful. Um, but essentially, the idea here is that unlike with RADC, where you're using restriction enzymes to reduce the complexity of the genome, with Grads D, we're using short random primers to generate amplicons across the entire genome to create effectively a reduced representation of anywhere between 1% to 10% of the, the total genome size. And then the sequencing reads are aligned across each samples, and then you can identify SNPs and call genotypes. So really, it's primarily a discovery tool. Um, you can use this in, in any species, with or without a reference genome. Um, so it's, it's a great alternative to low-pass sequencing. Uh, this, this diagram here just shows a very quick overview of the procedure. So say we do a, a library prep using two-step PCR with the short random primers. Those samples are then multiplexed, uh, barcoded and multiplexed, uh, run on the Illumina Nova C platform. And then we do the data analysis by aligning the reads uh, across each sample. Um, so it's a, it's a very cost-effective way to, to generate SNPs from relatively poorly um, characterized genomes. Furthermore, we can sort of tune this application depending on the size of the genome or the complexity of the genome or the expected SNP frequency by using different primer sets. Um, so we can effectively generate more or, or less amplicon species um, per sample according to the needs of the project. So the main applications of GRASD are for SNP discovery and genotyping, things like uh, linkage QTL mapping, population studies. Um, it's generally a, a sort of more cost-effective approach compared to low-pass sequencing or, or any sort of omic level sequencing like RNA-seq. One of the main benefits of using amplicons rather than restriction fragments is that you get a lot less missing data. Um, and furthermore, we have a high level of reproducibility because we're using amplicons that are essentially targeting the same regions um, throughout the genome. The whole process um, we've optimized for high throughput. Um, so we've automated the library prep um, and multiplex sequencing pipelines. Um, this, of course, in turn reduces the cost. Um, and you can use this with any species with or without a reference genome. And often the projects that we get, um, the species we're dealing with are, are, are poorly characterized reference genomes. So this is a, a very suitable alternative um, approach compared to, to low pass sequencing. And finally, one of, the, one of the main advantages over using sort of a RADSeq approach is that you can use a lot less sample input DNA. So say, for example, you have um, poor quality samples or, or a small amount of starting material, um, we can generate GRASD libraries with as little as six nanograms uh, of DNA, um, which I think is about a quarter of the recommended starting amount for a RADSeq based approach. This is just a, a short case study that our team in Japan um, have developed in rice using GRASD. Um, so in this study, they set up um, three experiments, um, basically altering the number of samples per sequencing lane. Um, so we had uh, four lanes with 24 samples, two lanes with 54 samples, and one lane with 96 samples. Um, and as you can see, the, this basically is a way of varying the amount of data output um, per sample. And as you can see, um, for test number one, where we have the most amount of sequence data, um, we generate the largest number of SNPs, just under 8,000 SNPs per sample. Um, conversely, if we have a, a single lane occupied by 96 samples, um, we get roughly half the number of SNPs. So again, this is just another way of tuning it. As I mentioned earlier, we have different primer sets that can be used, um, which can be used to um, alter the, the number of target SNPs that, um, that are generated. So again, it depends on the project needs. Um, we always consult with the client as to what is the end goal of, uh, of the project, and then we can advise which primer sets to use and how, much, uh, how many sequencing reads to apply per sample um, to achieve those goals. As you can see here, we had very low levels of, of missing data um, and very high reproducibility between runs for, for tests one and two. So this is just a nice little example um, internally. Um, externally, this is a, a great uh, publication from last year. This is in Nature Scientific Reports. 
um, with the group that used GRASD um, on, on wheat. Um, this is just some, uh, some excerpts from, from the abstract here. Um, but one of the main take homes, I think, is that GRASD was very effective um, for working with what essentially is quite a complex genome um, in this wheat progenitor. Um, and they were able to identify um, stable QTLs for flowering time and spikelet shape related traits using uh, GRASD. Um, it really is a very nice paper. Um, if I had more time, I'd go into it in more detail, but uh, I, I really encourage you to, to have a read of it if you, if you get time. The team in Japan have been, um, so we actually, it's a European site in Japan that, that uh, developed this protocol with um, Toyota. Um, they have done a, a large number of species now. I think it's over 70 different species. Um, this is just a, a quick summary of, of some of them uh, with the attached references. Uh, I'd be happy to, of course, uh, share these with anyone um, if they want to check these references. Uh, really a very wide range of plant species that have been used uh, with the GRASD method um, for marker uh, development. So just to summarize then finally, um, why would you consider Eurofins as a partner? Um, I, I think really what we can offer as a, as a service lab is we have a very strong team um, of experts. Um, a lot of our staff members have degrees in, in agriculture genetics. Um, we have a wide range of experience in, in working with different plant species um, and also soil samples for applications such as microbiome um, sequencing. Um, with that, you know, we have a large range of technology platforms. We can accommodate everything from, as I say, looking at a single marker um, all the way up to all the way up to hundreds of thousands or millions of markers across the entire genome, depending on, on what stage of uh, research your, your project is in. Um, our R&D team are always happy to discuss new projects, working on different species or new approaches. Um, we really do consider ourselves an R&D partner, um, even though we're not really exclusively an R&D company. Um, we are willing to, to explore um, working on, on things that we haven't necessarily done before. So always happy to, to work on, on consultations uh, for new projects. Um, and furthermore, we have a lot of experience developing custom kits um, and uh, custom protocols. Um, so nothing is, nothing is too challenging for us. Um, and if you have a project in mind, please do get in touch. We'd be happy to discuss it. And with that, I will end. And I think we, are, we have a lot of questions just coming now. So I'll, I'll stop sharing my screen and maybe we can bring Brad back into the room. Hi, Brad. Hello. All right. Oops, can you see me? Okay, good. You see you there. there we go. Um, we have a lot of questions and, and thank you very much everyone for sending in your questions. Um, <clears throat> perhaps I can start by uh, reading that one here. Okay, so um, Brad, you showed examples of using <clears throat> EMS and gamma irradiation. How do you decide which is the best mutagen to use? Sure, thanks. Um, yeah, before I answer, I, I do see the questions too in the in the in the chat. And if we don't get to everything, and you you have a question about mutations or whatever, you can always email me. I put my email at the beginning of the of the talk. So just uh, I'll do my best. Uh, I'll try to answer. I'm always happy to help people set up their experiments. You know, any advice I can give. So uh, please don't. Feel bad if I don't answer your question. Now, the question, and there's some questions on the chat I see about, you know, I've got multiple traits and I've got different things. And, and so that you start to get into the fine grain of what do I want to do? Uh, there was a question about safety of gamma radiation. And I answered that one in the chat because you have to have a secure area and you have, you know, it's a facility, usually it's a gamma radiator that's lead lined and there's somebody there. So there is some question about what can I access? What's easier for me to do? If you use chemicals, you have to be careful that you don't mutate yourself too. So there's a lot of safety protocols that you have to follow. Um, but the kind of short version of this, when I showed you in banana, like a gamma radiation had caused a 3.8 million base pair a single copy deletion. Now, I don't know how you really do reverse genetics on that because your question would be, I think this one gene or these two genes are affecting something. So there are some, uh, you know, like with fast neutrons, there are cases where people want deletions in a kind of reverse genetic fashion, but the tendency is to use point mutations for reverse genetics because then you can find that mutation in that one gene and really unambiguously answer that question, what is that gene doing? Versus, 
I think the power of the forward genetics with, with physical irradiation is that not only do you get these big deletions, but the spectrum that you get inversions and translocations. So there's a lot of SNP mutations and, uh, that get in induced. So you get a lot more genomic variation, I think, with a physical mutagen, making it more, I think, if you know, you might create more phenotypes with that. I don't think there's any real good data on that. And we certainly saw things both with EMS and gamma and banana because we wanted to do everything we could possibly do to have some success, but that maybe that's the best uh, best answer I can give is that if you're doing reverse genetics, you tend to think about point mutations and forward genetics, you're, you can consider anything you want. Great, thanks, uh, thanks Brad. Um, next question, where was it? Okay, this one's from Christoph. In the EU, mutagenesis is not considered a gene technology and the products not GMO provided, oh, sorry, and the products not GMO, provided that the technology used has a so-called history of safe use. Are there any recent developments in chemical or radiation mutagens or is it still the same that have been used for decades? Yeah, I, you know, the, the, uh, well, I mean, the mutagenesis itself is the same and that's the, that's the prior art and there is no regulation on, on the use right across the world, uh, including Europe. Now what changes is how we can evaluate those. So in forward genetics, you know, we've seen a lot of, so that you could be doing the same kind of mutation breeding that somebody did, you know, 50 years ago, but you might apply like a high throughput phenomics to that. You know, that's a new technology, but it doesn't affect the fact that it's a, a mutation and uh, around the world that's just considered sort of natural uh, and, and, you know, that's just the history of it. So, so uh, I don't think any screening technology, whether it's tilling or something you do to just evaluate the plants, I don't think that affects um, the, the, the plant itself, you know. Okay. Uh, great, thanks. Uh, a question from Dinesh here. Um, how do we adopt tilling technology to mutate multi-copy gene families? For example, ricin and RCA gene family in castor bean, where there are about 27 copies reported in the genome and they share more than 95% homology among them. Right. I would, I would, I, without having researched this ahead of time, I think if I, I would think about that decision tree and ask myself, how easy it is, it, would it be to do a CRISPR on that? That seems like a really good candidate, right? And, and if I was, and I would, I would investigate that a little bit more. Now, what you can do is you can find, um, you know, who, what would I do? I, you know, if you really wanted to do tilling, you would, you know, if you have, if you know all these genes, you'd have to, you know, be able to amplify them up and identify the point mutations. And, and people have done this where you cross multiple mutations back together. So you could pyramid things uh, later, but you could kind of do a cost benefit on that. Um, if I was testing rice and I don't know what the phenotype for that is because that's a poison I, I don't maybe but the, maybe there's like a mass spec or a, a near infrared reflectance spectroscopy thing you could do and in which case I might also be tempted to do forward genetics just because you can deal with the if you really want to know what the what happened and what caused the phenotype downstream you know there's a lot of great genomic tools now where you could do whole genome sequencing and try to figure out what happened uh, at the DNA level so I, I might also consider a forward genetic screen if I could nail down a good phenotype for that. Thank you. And maybe kind of related to that question is uh, one from, from Warren. Uh, what is more reliable, forward or reverse genetics? I guess that's quite a broad question. But what's your feeling? What's more reliable? Well, you're inducing mutations. I mean, at the one level, it's like you need the mutant population. So that early sort of generic forward reverse genetics uh, slide I showed had this mutant population which was feeding into either forward genetics or reverse genetics um, that we can reliably induce mutations at, at certain frequencies in, in all kinds of species. And so the question then is what, what's the def, what, how do you define reliable? And, you know, if you're using the same mutagen, you have the same phenotypes coming out, right? And then if you need to combine multiple, like there are cases where you need to pyramid and combine multiple alleles with each other, in which case, then reverse genetics would be better for you. Now, what that would mean is finding mutation one in line one and finding mutation two in line two, and then crossing them together and uh, homozygosing them, et cetera. So, 
uh, I think from the reliability, you just have to know the genetics and, and what you might need to do. Right. Um, Dario says, thanks for the interesting talk. Do you know what is an average percentage of real SNPs? In other words, those confirmed by Sanger sequencing, for example, among the ones that are identified in tilling by sequencing approaches? Yeah, that has to do with you and how you do your experiment and how you do your data analysis. So if you read uh, Pratik's paper, I think I said six different variant colors. So there's the, you know, there's the kind of variant color you're using and how you're analyzing the NGS data and the kind of filters you're applying. And you need to do some work on that part to make sure that you're accurate because you'll come up with different things with, with, um, threefold, uh, you know, uh, three-dimensional pooling, you can really reduce your error rates. Uh, we've, you know, we strive for, you know, 95 or higher percent accuracy, you know, depending on, on how you do that. And I tend to, in different papers, we kind of settle on looking at uh, several different variant callers. And this is the, so these are the algorithms that look at the next generation sequencing data and say, oh, I think that that is a mutation at this position. And the different algorithms perform a little differently. So what we'll tend to do is, is use like say three of them, you know, and do a Venn diagram and then prioritize the ones that all three would find. And those are the mm -hmm. highest confidence mutations. So we kind of layer confidences on but if you found of course if you found a really interesting knockout mutation with lower confidence you might bother to do a Sanger sequencing of that individual to double check mm -hmm. Be because why wouldn't you if you think that's a valuable mutation you might prioritize that even though you've got less confidence in the in the accuracy of the call great um one more question, maybe time for a couple more questions. What is the main difference between tissue culture mutagenesis versus seed mutagenesis? Uh, well, I, I would say that if you, if you have seed, mutagenize the seed. Um, because what you're using, you know, when you mutagenize the seed or mutagenize a tissue culture like a meristem and bananas, all the cells will accumulate different mutations. And so in seed mutagenesis, you can just propagate the plants and going through meiosis removes what we call chimeric sectors or genetic mosaicism that happens because of this multicellular process. Where in tissue culture, and I think there was a cassava question about M1V1, and if you're still listening, you know, you would want to, in tissue culture, you need to take pains to remove chimeric sectors. And so that would usually mean going to M1V3. Uh, for, for cassava and, and banana as well. We were, we were doing longitudinal bisections of the meristems to reduce uh, this, this chimeric effect. Okay. Um, George says, thanks for the great talk. Um, are all regions of the genome reachable by irradiation or are there areas which are kind of protected which you, you kind of tackle? Well, we haven't seen that. Yeah, you could imagine that there are there are regions that are more prone. I mean, when you think about irradiation, more prone to double strand breaks, you know, and, and more protected. And then the repair machinery may perform differently. Um, I, I don't think we have such good data sets. What we can say is on a on a kind of macro level, and we're we've been looking at this in rice and hopefully that. Uh, will be published in the, in the near future. But if you look across a genome like rice, you can see with gamma and x-ray radiation, you see accumulation of mutations on every chromosome, right? Mm -hmm. And you could argue that you might, you're probably not looking in these reference genomes at the centromeres too carefully. And I don't know if anybody has. So, you know, and, and nor you know, these highly repetitive regions, depending on what you're doing and how you're doing it, if you're doing whole genome sequencing, you're, you're probably missing some things. And certainly at the fine level, we see biases, small biases, you know, and point mutations and things uh, and, and in spontaneous mutations as well. There's some nice papers coming out recently in Arabidopsis looking at, you know, some, some biases and selective pressures against things. So it probably occurs, but not at any level where if you have a gene, you can't, I mean, we've never found a gene that we couldn't find a mutation in, for example. Right. Thank you. Um, I think maybe just quickly one one last question. Um, oh, it's just disappeared. I mean, where'd it go? <laughs> um, 
Uh, okay, there was actually one last question. I think it might be for me, by the way. It was from Peter asking about midplex. Um, does the five to 10 euros cost include the setup, uh, barcode design, panel optimization? Um, yes, it can. Um, broadly speaking, Peter, uh, to answer that question is a little bit tricky because it depends on the total number of samples you want to interrogate and the total number of SNPs. But as an example, we have done projects within that price range. Um, we basically amortize the cost of assay setup. And as long as you have a large number of samples at which cost, at which cost you can amortize that, we can achieve that five to 10 euro price point. Um, but please feel free to reach out, please. I'll be happy to discuss that uh, project in more detail if you have something in mind. Um, we did get a few more questions, but I think we are now out of time. Um, for me, I think we need to uh, um, call it a day here, but um, I think it's been really great. And thanks again, Brad, for your, your presentation. Uh, really interesting. And thank you, everybody, for your questions. Uh, it's really nice to, to see the turnout here today. Um, I think that you will be receiving a link um, in your emails to the, the webinar. It has been recorded. Um, and we will get back to you with, with any questions that, um, that we didn't have time to, to answer live here today. Um, so with that, I'd just like to thank everybody. And, and Brad, again, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. Um, Thank Thanks. you to the organizers. Um, and uh, yeah, everybody, hope you have a great day. Thanks. Bye, Bye everybody. Bye-bye.